You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Our opening prayer is from the book of Proverbs. Those who walk uprightly fear the Lord. Welcome and greetings. This is the second part of a look at the book of Proverbs, and so it's highly recommended that you listen to the talk of the first part, and even before that, to listen to the talk about the introduction to wisdom literature in general. So general notions are given there, uh, explaining wisdom literature, and I'll make references to that uh, particular talk as we go through the second part of the book of Proverbs here. Now we started in chapter 14, and I left sort of uh, what you call a little bit of a cliffhanger there, In chapter 14, we have in verse 4, Where there are no oxen, the crib is clean, but abundant crops come through the strength of the bull. Now, what does that mean? What is the author trying to tell us there? It's a contrast, and it's also a play on words in the Hebrew. First of all, you need to know that most words in Hebrew are made up of uh, three letters, triliteral roots, we call them. And prefixes and suffixes are put on them for different forms of the verbs and such, and also for the nouns as well. But basically, there are three letters when you transpose it into, say, for instance, uh, letters for English. Now, The word in Hebrew for clean would have the three letters B-A-R, bar, B-A-R. And the word for abundant in Hebrew would have the root letters of R-A-B, just the opposite. And so that's what this is. It's a play on this. And it's it's very clever. And it's a good way to remember it as well uh, for it. So clean and abundant. Now you'll notice, if you have your text there, that they come next to each other. Where there are no oxen, the crib is clean, but abundant crops come through the strength of the bull, to repeat it there. So clean and abundant are next to each other, and they come together uh, in a sort of juxtaposition for that. And the three letters are there, B-A-R and R-A-B. Or that. So it's a clever piece of writing. Now, what does it mean, though? What is it trying to say? Okay, the crib there, as it's translated, I'm using the New American Bible uh, translation for this, is the feeding trough for the oxen. And so a comparison is being made here. Where there are no oxen, the crib is clean because there's no food in it, and it's not being used at all. So it's clean in that sense. If you don't have work animals, you don't have to do anything to feed them or take care of them. And so your feeding trough would never be used. It would be clean. But the idea then is if you don't have work animals and that you're not working your farm uh, and growing crops and such, then you could be very lazy as well. But if you have work animals, you need to take good care of them so that they're healthy and able to plow the land for you. So abundant crops come from the strength of the bull, in other words, of the animal that's going to plow your field for you. And so you've got to feed it, and you've got to take care of it. And so then your feeding trough would be full for that. So that's the comparison that's made there. You need to know how to farm, how to use your equipment to have some wisdom. But the fool doesn't have those and doesn't put forth the effort, doesn't do the work. So his crib is clean, because he has no need to fill it or use it. You could say empty, but by saying clean, you've got this word that is similar to the same letters as the one for abundant. And so it makes the contrast for that, so that the word can be reversed. So the contrast is that of the opposites, the result of the fool and of the wise. 
And so it's reinforced by the words that are used. And so it's a clever kind of writing and something, again, that would be easy to remember. And it's a little bit difficult for us, but you can, if you take a look at it and think of what is underneath there in the letters and that it makes some sense. And of course, the phrase itself, the verse makes some sense as well. So it's a clever little bit of writing. Now, moving on then, and I'm just going through certain particular verses here and there. Could do any of a number of them. And of course, in this short talk, I'm not able to go through all of them. And as I mentioned before in the uh, previous talk, you could take any one of these and use them as a point of meditation, or especially in a discussion group, a Bible study group perhaps, you could take any one of these just about and use them as the topic for discussion. So I'm going to pull out a few that might be representative of wisdom literature or of the book of Proverbs, some things that would be interesting perhaps, and like this one, something that isn't too clear right on the surface and needs a little bit of explanation as well. There are a lot of them, and I can't take them all, but I will take a few of them uh, just uh, as examples. Okay, moving along in chapter 14 in verse 24, we read, The crown of the wise is wealth. The diadem of fools is folly. And here we have a characteristic of wisdom literature, the connection between wisdom and wealth. We've got to be careful with this. It's not just simply the profit motive, do what you can to get ahead for yourself. But wisdom and wealth were related. And I said in a previous talk, uh, Solomon is the example for that, who was both wise and wealthy. And the idea is they saw a connection between these two. That someone was, if someone was, were, were wise, they would be able to accumulate a certain amount of wealth. They would be prosperous. They'd be able to take care of themselves, take care of their family, provide for themselves. And if somebody did have uh, a certain amount of wealth, it was probably a good indication that they were wise because the assumption would be that they've gotten that wealth without stealing it or some other kinds of ill-gotten gain for it. And so the two were put together. Now, we've got to be careful with that, too. Again, as I said, it's not just simply the profit motive or that. And so they would always know, too, that if you had wealth, you were to use it for the good of others and not just hoard it for yourself. But here we have the crown of the wise is wealth. So if you have a uh, a certain amount of wisdom, you can use it to become wealthy. And the diadem of the crown of fools is that of folly. So that's all that they get for it. And where I'm to, the wealthy must also be generous. In verse 35, still in chapter 14, we read, The king favors the skillful servant, but the shameless one incurs his wrath. So you might see some of this in the Gospels that, in this particular verse. For instance, our Lord's parable about the master who entrusts his clients, his uh, servants, if you will, with his ta- with talents before he goes on a long journey. And then he settles accounts with them upon his return. And, of course, the one uh, doubles, and the other one doesn't get quite as much to begin with, but also doubles that. But the lazy servant does nothing but buries his master's money. So the king favors the skillful servant, but the shameless one incurs his wrath. And that's what happens in the story for this. And so our Lord would have known of this story. And uh, similar ones were used by the rabbis as examples. And Jesus takes this story and tells it himself in his own version, in his own way. Going on to chapter 15 now in the book of Proverbs in verses 16 and 17 we have a series of better sayings. And this we'll find throughout the wisdom literature, and especially throughout Proverbs, something is better than something else. Because oftentimes in life, the choices are not simply between good and bad, good and evil, right and wrong. Sometimes the choices are what's good, but what could be better? And call us to do something better. So, 
There are a series of these in verse 16 of chapter 15. Better a little with fear of the Lord than a great fortune with anxiety. Verse 17, better a dish of herbs where there is love than a fatted ox and hatred with it. Okay, these are some, they're kind of clear for that. But they make us think a little bit. Also, too, in uh, chapter 16, in verse 19, it is better to be humble with the poor than to share plunder with the proud. How much better to get wisdom than gold? To get understanding is preferable to silver. All these from chapter 16. Statements to think about. You could take one a day and ponder on it. And some other, uh, going through this chapter, some other verses to think about. Uh, in verse, uh, fifth, uh, chapter 15, in verse 20, a wise son gives joy to his father, but a fool despises his mother. Also in chapter 15, verse 22, plans fail when there is no counsel, but they succeed when advisors are many. Do you think so? We have another saying outside the Bible, an old saying, too many cooks spoil the broth. This would seem to be the opposite of that. What do you think? Again, life is not so simple. The choices are not so clear. Sometimes one thing is better than another. Sometimes something is not really a choice between good or evil. But what choices are you going to make? What are you going to do? Chapter 16, again. uh, All one's ways are pure in one's own eyes, but the measure of motives is the Lord. Perverse speech sows discord, and tail-bearing separates bosom friends. The way gossip and speaking uh, behind someone's back can hurt them and can hurt a friendship. In chapter 17, we've got yet another comparison, a better saying. Better a dry crust with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. True enough, but something to think about. And, And interesting, in chapter 17, verse 5, Whoever mocks the poor reviles their maker. Whoever rejoices in their misfortune will not go unpunished. Even in the non-biblical literature, ancient uh, literature, uh, we have examples of this, where one uh, text speaks about, don't tease someone who is handicapped, because God made them. And so something here, uh, don't mock the poor. Because whoever does that is reviling their maker, God. So we are all children of God, and so should be respected. But it's interesting, even in the non-biblical and the pagan literature, it's uh, similar kinds of things, uh, not to take advantage of people. And one of the reasons being a theological reason, because their God will protect them in the pagan uh, theology. But the idea that uh, they are a product of a God and so uh, deserve some respect. So even there, it is found. Other things that are in there? Uh, it would be uh, similar to what happens in the gospel, for instance, some of these sayings, where something is proposed and then it's debated or it's discussed. The rabbis would do this as a way of learning and as a way of teaching. And so, for instance, in the scene in the gospel, where the person comes up to Jesus and asks, which is the greatest commandment? The rabbis would do this. Somebody would propose, well, I think this is the better commandment or the best commandment, and then others could debate. They did it in order to learn about the commandments and to see their relationships and then to be able to teach others as well. It was a pedagogical technique. And so, You'll find this as well in the book of Proverbs. It goes back uh, quite far for that. And uh, to propose something then and debate it. So our Lord engaged in that when he answered the question, which is the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, 
And then said, the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And this was a technique that the rabbis would use. And so you'll find it as you go through these chapters of the book of Proverbs. Another interesting one. In chapter 17, we're still in there. Verse 12, face a bear robbed of her cubs, but never fools in their folly. There's a kind of graphic example there, a contrast made. In verse 21, it's a little bit of a twist to it. It's told from the parent's point of view. In verse 21, whoever conceives a fool has grief. The father of a numbskull, as the New American calls it, has no joy. And so, from the parents' point of view, about their children. In chapter 18, verse 8, The words of a tale-bearer are like dainty morsels. They sink into one's inmost being. In verse 22, To find a wife is to find happiness, a favor granted by the Lord. There are a number of passages that you're going to come across where it talks about uh, a, a wife who is uh, not one that uh, is not doing something wrong, but something that's hard to live with. Let's just put it that way. And there are examples of this. You can't deny it. They're in there. But remember, too, it cuts both ways. And so a husband can be hard to live with as well. But here we find that uh, just the opposite. A wife, to find a wife is to find happiness, a favor granted by the Lord. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we come towards the end of the book of Proverbs. It's a beautiful, uh, rendition of like almost a poem about uh, a beautiful wife to sort of counteract this. So I'm pointing this out simply to sort of keep it fair and, uh, I'll say it again as we go through and see some other examples. Chapter 19, verse 6. Many curry favor with a noble. Everybody is a friend of a gift giver. How true that is. Verse 11. It is good sense to be slow to anger and an honor to overlook an offense. Verse 12. The king's wrath is like the roar of a lion, but his favor like dew on the grass. And remember, in this area, it's very dry, very arid, and so dew on the grass, uh, the moisture is very, very much uh, it looked forward to and is very much appreciated for that. So again, the agricultural context that many of these come out of. Verse 13, The foolish son is ruined to his father, and a quarrelsome wife is water constantly dripping. Okay. There's one example of it. Verse 14. Home and possessions are an inheritance from parents, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. So to counteract that for that. So you'll see a balance there for it. As some of them will stick out more than others. And remember, it goes both ways. Uh, for the husband as well. Verse 17. Whoever cares for the poor lends to the Lord, who will pay back the sum in full. When you did it for one of the least of my brothers, you did it for me, as our Lord said. An echo of that here. Verse 21. Many are the plans of the human heart, but it is the decision of the Lord that endures. As a spiritual writer once said, man proposes, God disposes. Now, in verse 27, My son, stop attending to correction. Start straying from words of knowledge. It's a little bit of a reverse psychology here. It would shake you up a little bit. You're going along with all these things to do, and all of a sudden you hear the opposite. It's to get you to stop for a moment. Maybe break the monotony a little, if you will, for it. Kind of interesting there. Let's go on to chapter 21. Verse 13. Those who shut their ears to the cry of the poor will themselves call out and not be answered. Okay. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The golden rule. Verse 23. Those who guard mouth and tongue 
guard themselves from trouble. Now into chapter 22. A good name is more than more, uh, excuse me, a good name is more desirable than great riches and high esteem than gold and silver. So again, the wealth, but there are things that are more important than wealth. Verse 2, rich and poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. What we just heard beforehand with that, don't despise the poor. Because the Lord is their maker and has all rich and poor in his providence. In verse 20, have I not written for you 30 sayings containing counsels and knowledge? In verse 21, to teach you truly how to give a dependable report to the one who sends you. I mentioned earlier in one of the other talks, one of the goals or the objectives of wisdom was to be able to instruct people who would be diplomats. When they went to foreign countries that had different laws and were dealing with people in matters where a law wasn't there to be able to guide or direct them. And so what was the prudent thing to do? The tactfulness, the diplomacy that would be needed where there wasn't a firm law saying you do this or don't do that, where there was give and take and compromise and such, especially when different countries had vastly different law codes for them. And so the idea being that wisdom helps you to find out how to do this. And so this is an echo of that. So the 30 sayings, different things of consuls and knowledge, not commandments, but advice, how to do things in different situations. Not all of them are clear commands, like the 10 commandments or that. And so that you would be able to give a dependable report to the one who sends you. That would be to report back to the king. If you were an ambassador and you had to report back of what you had done and said and what you saw observed in the country that you were at, to be able to do that. So you need a certain amount of skill for the diplomacy for that. So here's an example of that. Uh, that is part of, in the, tra- it's part of the tradition of wisdom and it, it crops up now and again. So as you see these as you go through, that's what the background is for them. In verse uh, 24 of chapter 22, do not be friendly with hotheads or associate with the wrathful. Especially in the wisdom literature of the Egyptians, they talked about the silent one, the one who was in control, had his emotions or her emotions uh, within boundaries, were able to control him or herself. And so the opposite was the hot one, the hot one or the silent one. And some of this creeps into the biblical literature. And here is one of this. Don't be friendly with hotheads. The hot one is the one who's out of control, cannot control their emotions. Another characteristic of the wisdom literature is that wisdom is found in a number of different places and in a number of different ways. I mentioned this in the first talk about the notion of wisdom in general. And so a craftsman has a certain amount of wisdom because they have a trade that they can do things. They know how to make things like a carpenter or a mason or that. And so the skilled craftsman for this. So that has a value and that's a gift from God. And so in chapter 22, verse 29, do you see those skilled at their work? They will stand in the presence of kings, but not in the presence of the obscure. There's a value to this. In chapter 23, in verse 10, it speaks about, do not remove the ancient landmark, nor invade the fields of the fatherless. What's going on there? In verse 11, for their Redeemer is strong, and he will defend their cause against you. The boundaries are the land boundaries. And the idea being, and there's an agricultural context here, which is found often in the wisdom literature and in the Proverbs, they tend to deal with agricultural issues and crops and uh, flocks and such. The boundaries are here 
for the land, for someone's farm, and for the fatherless, this is for the orphan. And throughout the Old Testament, the poor, the widow, and the orphan are a special possession of God. They have no one else to depend upon. They don't have family. They don't have wealth. They don't have resources. And so they look especially to God, and he in turn especially cares for them. He is their redeemer. Okay, he's usually the redeemer was the, a member of the family who watched out for other members of the family, but they don't have family if they're an orphan or a widow for that. So he is their redeemer. And the idea being don't cheat or move the boundaries of an orphan's land because that orphan needs that land to be able to support themselves. And so if you move the boundaries to get more of their land, you're cheating them. And it could have disastrous results, especially in a very arid country where you're sort of living on the edge as far as survival for many of these people. And so they need a very good crop and they need all of the area they can farm for their survival. And if you steal some of their land, you're stealing some of their ability to cultivate their crops. And it could cause them uh, to starve. And so the importance of that, we don't think of that. We've got to sort of shift gears here a little bit because we think of so much that, you know, we've got an abundance of food. Not all, not everywhere in the world. Uh, certainly within most of our own country, and we're not uh, actually doing the actual planting and growing of our own food. So we've got to be sensitive to this, of what's going on, the agricultural context. Now, in chapter 23, verses 13 and 14, we've got a problem. Do not withhold discipline from youths. If you beat them with the rod, they will not die. Beat them with the rod, and you will save them from Sheol. Sheol is a place, a darkest place after you die. It's uh, kind of a nebulous uh, idea. Uh, It develops more and more as the time goes on within the the era of the Old Testament and such. And, of course, coming into the Christian area, we think of heaven and hell. But Sheol here is this sort of nebulous place that you go to uh, when you die, and it's not a very good place. For it, But the problem is, of course, uh, you don't beat children. And, of course, we would not agree with this today. So you are going to find some time-conditioned verses within this. It's true of all the Old Testament, all the violence that's in there and such. You've got to, you know, you can't just forget about it. You can't ignore it. You've got to deal with it. And here is one of uh, these examples. Now, an interesting thing is starting in verse 29. Here is an excellent description of drunkenness. We read, Who scream? Who shout? Who have strife? Who have anxiety? Who have wounds for nothing? Who have bleary eyes? Whoever linger long over wine? Whoever go around quaffing wine? Do not look at On the wine, when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, it goes down smoothly, but in the end it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes behold strange sights, and your heart utters incoherent things. You are like one sleeping on the high seas, sprawled at the top of the mast. They struck me, but it did not pain me. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When can I get up? When can I go out and get more? Okay, verses 29 to 35 of uh, chapter 23. And so the idea of feeling no pain, uh, uh, someone wakes up the next day with uh, bruises and so wonders what happened to them, what happened the night before and stuff, all of that. It's interesting. That's all the things that are being talked about here in this ancient document, in the Bible itself. And to be careful. For that you behold strange sights, you say incoherent things, things that you are sorry for, uh, perhaps the next day and such. And like one sleeping on the high seas. Uh, if you've ever been in a boat, and even if not, you can imagine 
in a, a, a storm and such, you want to get down lower because the boat rocks at a lesser angle the closer it is down by the surface. If it's up at the top of the mast and it's rocking back and forth, the arc is so much wider, so many more degrees. And so that's the idea of this, that it would be like when you are intoxicated, uh, it's like being uh, sleeping on the high seas, sprawled at the top of the mast, where the arc is the greatest as the boat is rocking back and forth. So that's the image that's there. You have to use your imagination a little bit, but you see what it is. And uh, an interesting description, very true to life. Uh, and it doesn't take much. You don't have to experience it to realize what's being said here. Chapter 25, in verse 6 and 7. Claim no honor in the king's presence, nor occupy the place of superiors, for it is better to be told, come up closer, than to be humbled before the prince. And of course, our Lord speaks of this. When you are invited to a banquet, don't take the highest place. Someone greater may come, and you have to move down and down and down until you're in the last place. So very similar to our Lord's words in the gospel. In verse uh, 17 of chapter 25, let your foot not, let your foot be seldom in your neighbor's house, lest they have their fill of you and hate you. Don't overstay your welcome. Very good practical advice. Now in chapter 25, in verse 24, you'll notice it's a repeat of what's in chapter 21 at verse 9. It's simply because they come from two different collections, and this is seen a few times. Chapter 26, verse 22, repeats chapter 18, verse 8. Again, there's two collections that were put together here in the final redacting of the book. It's no problem. There was no problem for them. There's no problem for us as well. It just simply is a repetition. In chapter 26, you will find very strong words against the fool. And again, it's done for the sake of example, to make very clear what the teaching is. But we also have a little bit of a conundrum, maybe perhaps, in chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. We read, Do not answer fools according to their folly, lest you too become like them. And then in the next verse, Answer fools according to their folly, lest they become wise in their own eyes. What's going on there? It seems a contradiction. It's again saying that things are not always so simple. In the first uh, section of this, verse 4, Do not answer fools according to their folly, lest you too become like them. Don't stoop to their level. It's very clear. But what about that next verse? Answer fools according to their folly, lest they become wise in their own eyes. Sometimes, the only way you can answer is to ridicule, in a sense. To get through to someone. Because otherwise, they'll think they're right. You've got to show them the ridiculousness of their situation. It has to be done in charity, but still, sometimes you've got to be very direct and very strong. And so... The contrasting two verses there and how to deal with fools. And again, the idea of a fool. It's uh, very much uh, a very clear delineation for the sake of clear example. They realized we're a mixture of both. We do foolish things, we do wise things. Verse 17 of chapter 26. Whoever meddles in the quarrel of another, is one who grabs a passing dog by the ears. We have our own saying, let sleeping dogs lie. The same kind of an idea. Verse 18 is very interesting. The damage that we can do without realizing it, or without considering the consequences of one's actions. Verse 18. Like a crazed archer scattering firebrands and deadly arrows, verse 19, 
Such are those who deceive their neighbor and then say, I was only joking. So words have consequences. And sometimes we don't even realize how much words can hurt. And just to say, well, I was only joking. Still, the hurt might still be there. And it's like an archer scattering firebrands. In other words, fire-tipped arrows that are going to start a huge fire someplace. Chapter 27, verse 4. Anger is cruel and wrath overwhelming. But before jealousy, who can stand? Something to think about there. Verse 5. Better is an open rebuke than a love that remains hidden. Is it so? Do you think so? Is it always that way? Maybe, maybe not. Something again to think about. Now, verse 10 needs a little explanation. Do not give up your own friend and your father's friend. Do not resort to the house of your kindred when trouble strikes. Better a neighbor near than kin far away. Hmm. What's going on there? All right. It's on two levels. It's a metaphor. Don't give up your own friend or your father's friend. So you rely upon your friends. You rely upon your family and the friends of your family, so your other relatives and such. So your friend, your father's friend, other relatives, uh, friends of your family and such. You rely upon them. Do not resort to the house of your kindred when trouble strikes. What's going on there? Better a neighbor near than kin far away. So your relatives and your friends sometimes are not near physically. They don't live near you. And so if some danger comes up, there's some crisis or that, they may not be available. They just might not be there or be able to get there in time. So it's better to have a neighbor who's near and can help you out right away. They help you put a fire out at your house or something like that than kin, family, or that who are far away. All right. But also, on another level, better a neighbor that's near in the sense of close to you in the sense of emotionally, or that is close to you in the sense of cares for you, than kin that might be very aloof or very distant or cold towards you. So it's not just a physical nearness, but also an emotional one or a psychological one. It's talking about both of them and making the comparisons. So better a neighbor that's near, not only physically, because they're right there and can help you, they're right next door to you, but also one that might be more sympathetic towards you than your kin who are maybe living far away, but might be distant from you in the sense of being aloof. So, works on both levels there. A lot of wisdom there. Now, verse 14 of chapter 27 is a good warning. Those who greet their neighbor with a loud voice in the early morning, a curse can be laid to their charge. Don't disturb another's sleep early in the morning. Wise words. Again, as you go through these sections, you will find injunctions and warnings against foreign women. And the reason being because they could be a temptation to the faith of the people, to draw them away from the true faith, to draw them away from the worship of God and into paganism. And so it's a warning for that. Just take it as time-conditioned as it is and move on from it. Uh, Again, other things. For a persistent leak on a rainy day, the match is a quarrelsome wife. All right. And again, remember, it goes both ways for that. And you'll see this over and over again with it. Uh, in Again, we're still in chapter 27. In verse 16, Whoever would hide her hides a storm wind and cannot tell north from south. And so the idea being that you, you you can't if there's a there's quarrelsome uh there's a quarrelsome situation, if there's strife, you can't hide it. 
and it's going to just overwhelm you in other ways and in other areas of your life as well. Like a storm wind, you can't tell north from south. It, it just uh, overwhelms you and that, again, uh, true enough, but uh, be careful with it. And verse 17 then, iron is sharpened by iron. One person sharpens another. Okay, for that. So let's move on now to chapter 28. Verse 19, those who cultivate their land will have plenty of food, but those who engage in idle pursuits will have plenty of want. The agricultural context, the idea of doing work, uh, taking and providing for yourself and for your family. It takes a lot of hard work to be successful. Even just to survive, it takes some work. In chapter 29, verse 11, you have what was borrowed from the Egyptian wisdom literature, the idea of the silent one, to be the model for it, the one that's in control of their emotions and such. Chapter 30, then, we have the words of Augur. We don't know who Augur was. We don't have any idea. But he will ask the same questions that Job will ponder as well for it. And so it's sort of a little bit of a preview. Job will go much further into it and uh, in much greater depth, but still some of the same kinds of questions. Some have thought that perhaps uh, there's a little bit of skepticism here. It could be, but it doesn't necessarily have to go that far. It just simply is a questioning, uh, looking a little deeper into things. And, of course, Job will do it to a much greater extent. Now, also, too, as we go along here, we get into chapter 30. We have the, uh, what I called earlier in one of the other talks, the X plus one, a series with one more. And there are a number of examples all the way through here. It was a device to help one remember in an oral based society to remember the, um, series. And also, too, it was a way oftentimes to emphasize one thing in the series. Usually, but not always, the last element was the one to be stressed. I gave an example in the other talk of where that wasn't true, where there was a series in the uh, more important, uh, the more serious series uh, of the series was in the middle. But at any rate, oftentimes the last one will be stressed, and it's a way, again, a good style of writing for it. So in verses 7 to 9, we have one. Two things I ask of you, do not deny them before, deny them to me before I die. All right, and there's no plus here, just the two. Put falsehood and lying far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Provide me only with the food I need. Lest full, I deny you, saying, Who is the Lord? Or being in want, I steal and profane the name of my God. So the idea of the, the golden mean, just enough, nothing to extremes, of wealth or of poverty. Because if you have too much wealth, it can make you arrogant and make you forgetful of God. And poverty can lead you to bitterness and greed, and ambition, and jealousy, and a life of crime. So the idea of that. So there's no plus one here. There's just the two things and that for it. Give me just these two things. Keep the other two, keep two things far from me. Falsehood and lying, and poverty and riches. Okay, for that. Now, in chapter, still in chapter, the same chapter, chapter uh, 30, in verse 15, verse 15, the leech has two daughters, give and give. Three things never get their fill, four never say enough. So here's the X plus one, X meaning just a number, two or three or four, and then plus one more. So here it's three plus one. So the leech has two daughters, give and give, and then three things never get their full, their fill, excuse me, four never say enough. What are they? Sheol, 
a barren womb, land that never gets its fill of water, and fire. Those are the things that never say enough. What is this? All right. So the leech has two daughters, give and give more. All right. That's simple enough. Then three things never get their fill, four never get their fill. Sheol, that's, of course, as we saw, the abode of the dead. It's never filled. Right. People will continue to die. A barren womb also does not say enough. It never is filled with a child. And so, never says enough. doesn't have at least one child. Land that is parched. It doesn't have enough water to be fertile. And again, they're living on the edge of the desert, and this becomes uh, a matter of survival. So, three things never say enough. Three things never get their fill and say, enough is enough. I've got enough. Sheol, because people will continue to die. The barren womb, because it never has a child. The land that is parched, because it never has enough water to be fertile. And then fire. Fire never says enough, because it consumes everything in its path. And it, it rightfully fits here as the last in the series, because it is the most dangerous, and can do the most destruction, and can destroy houses, cities, lands for it. And so it can, if left untended, if left uncontrolled, it never says enough. It never gets its fill. It destroys everything in its path. So an interesting X plus one. Verse 18, we have a three plus one again. Three things are too wonderful for, for me. Yes, four I cannot understand. And what are they? Verse 19. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a woman. Verse uh, 21. Under three things the earth trembles. Yes, under four it cannot bear up. Under a slave who becomes king, and a fool who is glutted with food, under an unloved woman who is wed, and a maidservant who displaces her mistress. You can think about those all the way through there. The way of an eagle in the sky, how do birds fly? Now, we have some more knowledge of that through our science, but it, you know, it would have, have amazed them, as it still amazes us in some ways as well. How do birds fly? The way of a serpent on a rock, how can it slither along? It has no legs or anything for that, but it can move, and it can move quickly. The way of a ship on the high seas, the way it gets tossed around back and forth and still is able to remain afloat. And the way of a man with a woman, an explanation of love. Then, under three things, the earth trembles, it quakes. Under four, it can't bear up. Under a slave who becomes a king, in reversal of fortunes, as you can imagine. A fool who is glutted with food. An unloved woman who is wed, and a maidservant who displaces her mistress. Again, the reversal of fortune there. You can debate which might be the worst of all those four. It's a good topic for discussion. Verse 24. Four things are among themselves smallest on the earth, and yet are exceedingly wise. Ants. A species not strong, yet they store up their food in the summer. Badgers, a species not mighty, yet they make their home in the crags. They can live in the mountains and survive and such. Locusts, they have no king, yet they march forth in formation. Think of the plagues and the plague of locusts. And they come on like an army devouring everything coming out of the skies. And lizards, you can catch them with your hands. Yet they find their way into king's palaces. You can't get rid of them. And you can't, in a sense, defeat them. You can catch them, but you can't eradicate them. <laughs> kind of interesting. It's not, uh, it's said just simply in four things, not in three plus four. But uh, all of them could be uh, very, very dangerous uh, for that. Okay. In verse 29, three things are stately in their stride. Yes, four are stately in their carriage. The lion, mightiest of beasts, retreats from nothing. 
the strutting cock, and the he-goat, and the king at the head of his people. Of course, that would be the most important, the last one there. So the animals, uh, that uh, that uh, they're stately in their stride. So the mighty king of beasts, the lion prancing around, uh, the cock, uh, the strutting rooster, and that, and then the he-goat that can uh, make its way up the sides of mountains and that almost, it seems, and such, and so is so sure-footed in that. And then the king at the head of his people is also very stately for it. It's a good style. And it helps, again, in an oral basis to be able to remember them, how many you need, and what's the last one. And that oftentimes is the most important. And it gives you something to figure out. Now we come now to the final chapter of Proverbs, and that is chapter 31. Now we don't know who Lemuel is, as we didn't know who Agur is. We don't know who he is. It may be a king. It may be a prince. It may be a king recalling his instructions by his mother with this. So he's the king of Massa, and the instructions his mother taught him when he was the prince, when he was growing up, in that sense. So, again, the instruction of a parent for a child, and that goes right back to the beginning of the book of Proverbs. An instruction of a father for his son or for his daughter, and mothers and fathers instructing. It's one of the themes of wisdom. So here we have it in chapter 31. This king uh, of Massa And the instruction his mother taught him when he was a child, when he was the prince for it. And there's good advice. But I want to uh, center on the end of the chapter, verses 10 to 31. It is a beautiful, beautiful piece. It closes with a description of the perfect wife. So given all that has been said about women, about uh, a quarrelsome wife, and the comparisons made and such, and every once in a while, sprinkled within that, of course, would be the prudent wife as a gift from God. Interestingly, the one verse that I mentioned before, where you get your possessions and such, you might inherit them, but a prudent wife is a gift from God. And so this closes the whole book And it is a beautiful speech about a wife. And it's interesting in many ways. First of all, she's very independent. She is very self-reliant. She's what we would call today an entrepreneur. She's a businesswoman, besides also being a mother and a wife. And she has her own business, and she is successful. Think about that back in that day and in that time. She's held up as an ideal of one who is on her own in a way, but yet still part of her family. Her family is very important to her and providing for them her winter clothing that she makes. But yet she's also able to have her own business and be able to sell things and do with what, with her profits what she wants. So she buys some things on her own. It's fascinating. Just in a sociological uh, aspect there of what she's able to do for that. But also, too, it is a masterpiece in its writing because it is an acrostic of the Hebrew alphabet. Verses 10 through 31. Each line, each verse, begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet in order all the way through for that. And the Knox Bible translation, K-N-O-X, the Knox Bible, you can get it online, He did it in English. It's unbelievable in some ways. He was able to do it in the English alphabet, A through, all the way down. Uh, I don't believe that uh, there's a Q in it and that, uh, or that, but you'll see it if you can get a a hold of a Knox Bible. Uh, It says A, B, C, D, all the way through. Each line 
in successive order. He did it in the English translation. There are a couple of other examples of this, and they're just, they're unbelievable uh, to see the artistry to be able to do it. Now, Knox had to be kind of free with the translation from the Hebrew to be able to pull it off and have it make sense, but still, it was an amazing accomplishment. So, if you can get a hold of a Knox Bible, again, it's K-N-O-X, you can see it in English. So, this brings us then to the end of the book of Proverbs. And what a fitting way to end it with this masterpiece about the perfect wife. It's a balance against uh, Dame Folly, the foreign women, the annoying wives and such, and a beautiful way to put it all back together. So, I've gone over just the highlights of it. Uh, I've been very selective in what I've chosen, but it gives you an idea. And uh, again, the uh, it's uh, something very useful for a Bible study, a group discussion, or just for your own meditations, take a little bit at a time of it. Maybe even just a verse. You could take a verse a day and think about it. You could also take some of the ideas and try to apply them. It's a way of sort of finding out how do you make your way in life, and especially in situations where it isn't always so clear of right and wrong. Sometimes the choice is between good and better. Sometimes the advice is just what would be a good thing to do here? There are other choices that might be equally good as well. And so life is oftentimes not so simple. But it all leads back to God, because wisdom comes from God and leads us towards God. And again, the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. Not that idea of terror, but the idea of awe to realize the majesty of God and our place before God and the importance of what we do for ourselves and for our neighbor as well, all in relation to God. So the fear of the Lord, the idea of the understanding of who God is in our lives, is the beginning of wisdom and all wisdom whether it be the simple wisdom of a craftsman, someone who knows how to do things, someone who's very adept at things, all the way through how to get along with others, the diplomacy, for instance, and relations with others, with your neighbor, all the way up to the wisdom of knowing what are the ultimate questions in our lives. Where is all of this going? What is our destiny? All of that is part of wisdom. Some of the results of wisdom, it should make us a little bit wealthy, not out of hand, not out of control. It should help us to keep our emotions together. It should make us happy, not complacent necessarily, but uh, satisfied with what we have and being able to be thankful for what we have, to be willing to share it with others, to be aware of the needs of others when we can help them. All of these things are all part of the wisdom. They all come from God. They all lead to God. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.